Welcome to Lunch with Books. Will the class please come to order? <laughs> if you have, you know the drill, if you have a cell phone, well, some of you are new here, so if you have a cell phone, please turn off the sound so that we are not interrupted. Thank you. If you'd like to be on our mailing list, the box is over there. Uh, I want to mention that this Thursday there will be a special program in the evening starting at 6 p.m. We'll have a reception followed by the opening of a new photography exhibit up here on the stage. Uh, photographs by Bill Burke taken in the 1970s here in Wheeling. And um, Bill will speak at 7 p.m. and then you can view the photographs. Next Tuesday the Wheeling Poetry Series uh, continues with Amy Alvarez and Mark Carson will be here to host that. And then the week after that, more poetry with Bonnie Thurston, one of our favorites, who will uh, be here on the stage on the 31st, the last May program. Okay, we all know that Wheeling is a city of immigrants. We know there are Italians and Germans and Greeks and Lebanese and Scott Irish and Irish. And what? What's that? <laughs> Some Polish, really? Oh. Yeah. So we're all familiar with that. Many of them have their own festivals and their churches and their cultures are a part of our culture. But did you know that the Norwegians were here too? Oh. Maybe they were. Aaron Rothenbuehler is back. Remember Aaron? Yeah. Probably the best programmer we ever had here on the stage. And she did a great job. And she's back to tell us about Norby. She's now the director of the Bolero Public Life. Here she is, Karen Rothenberg. Hello. Thank you. Hold your applause for the end. We'll see if you actually want to give it to me after listening to this. Um, so I'm just, oh, I gotta pull up my slides here. So, um, you, know, you all came, so apparently there are more people interested in Norse uh, history of Wheeling than I thought of, thought, so um, I hope you don't all hate me at the end of this program, um, because this is a Norse history of Wheeling, sort of. <laughs> so, and uh, those, Sean introduced me, my last name's Rothenbuehler, and you might say, uh, what's a person with the last name Rothenbuehler doing a program on Norwegians? Um, and why are we doing a, a history of the Norse and Wheeling? And the answer is that I grew up surrounded by Norwegians. Um, both my parents had grandparents um, who immigrated to the United States from Norway. Um, one of them had four. Norwegian grandparents, and one of them had one Norwegian grandparent. So I'm going to test um, some, I'm going to quiz you, and we're going to test our stereotypes here. And uh, this is a picture. That's me at my baptism, Lutheran Church. You can't be Scandinavian without going to the Lutheran Church. Um, so I'm going to quiz you. Which one do you think is my 100% Norwegian parent? Okay. It's my mom. <laughs> So not all Norwegians are blonde and blue-eyed. That's a, a stereotype. A lot of them are. It's predominant, but um, just like you have the black Irish, you also have Norwegians like myself, who have the brown hair and brown eyes. Um, and having said that, my brother's going to kill me if he tunes into this and he sees this picture. But uh, this is us at age three and ten. <laughs> so even though I never had his um, his blonde hair, his blue eyes. Yeah, but I did have the stereotypical one here for a very brief <laughs> period of time. Um, so for those of you who are keeping track, that makes me, um, I have five Norwegian grandparents, or great-grandparents, and three not Norwegian grandparents. So it should be five-eighths Norwegian and three-eighths not Norwegian. So um, has anybody here had their DNA tested? Did anybody get surprising results? Okay, so I'm going to let you guess how much you think my DNA came back Norwegian. Any any guesses? Any other guesses? Okay, came back 100% Norwegian. 
uh, I don't even know how this is possible. Um, uh, maybe great grandpa Rothenbuehler from Switzerland was hiding something. I don't know, but um, maybe the the, the Viking um, that tradition of, of pillaging and, uh, and raiding is so predominant that it even goes into the uh, the, the recombinant DNA at inception. I don't know. Um, Where's where Sean go? My, my dear colleague and, and friend, uh, Sean Duffy says that this just makes me incredibly inbred. Um, <laughs> but I think that he's just still upset that the, the Vikings uh, invaded Ireland. That's <laughs> um, So you might say that this is all fine and dandy, uh, but what does this have to do with wheeling? And um, Sean already touched upon this, but it, uh, the answer to that is wheeling's history itself. So. Um, so many of the stories of Wheeling's families are so similar to those of my great-grandparents and my grandparents and my parents. Um, they're immigrants, they're first-generation Americans, uh, second-generation Americans, and they bring their cultures with them and they pass them down from generation to generation. So how many of you have parents or grandparents who are first-generation Americans? Quite a few. Um, so your story is the same as my story, basically. You know, we are, we're all, um, we're all, Product of immigrants, and this is, as Sean said, it's a city of immigrants. Um, so now uh, I'm a third generation uh, American, American Norwegian, and although the, I'm three generations removed from that immigration, I am a migrant to Wheeling. Um, so I grew up in northern Wisconsin, where all of the Minnesota and Wisconsin, that's where all the Norwegians ended up. Um, both my mother's side of the family immigrated to northern Wisconsin and they've stayed there ever since. Um, so it's pretty much what you would expect. There's a lot of snow and there are a lot of cows. <laughs> so, um, yeah. so I came to Wheeling in 2004 and in July I will have been here for 18 years. Um, back in 2004 I only intended to be here for a year but I really I fell in love with the area and Wheeling is it's really home to me now. Um, and again, like Sean said in his intro, part of what I love about Wheeling is this diverse culture and heritage that you, you get from this influx of all of these immigrants. Um, and one of the great things about Wheeling is that we have all these different cultural festivals throughout the year. Um, so we got Wheeling culture, that's what makes this great. Um, we have the, the Greek festival, the Celtic festival, the Lebanese festival, uh, we have the Polish and Polka festivals, the Italian-American festivals, and we have Oktoberfest for the Germans, um, but uh, no, no Norwegian festivals here, <laughs> no Scandinavian culture, uh, festivals at all. So um, where I grew up in northern Wisconsin, uh, we didn't really have these type of cultural festivals. We had um, smelt feeds, we had broth fests, and we had Ludafisk dinners. Um, and if you don't know what Ludafisk is, uh, consider yourself lucky. <laughs> so, uh, so back home, we really uh, we didn't celebrate our culture so much as we celebrated our food. And all these foods have a, sort of a cultural background, but we, everything was so homogenized that we were really more focused on the food than the culture itself. Um, so my sophomore year of college, I had to take a sociology class, and one of their assignments was to write a paper about your culture. And I really, really struggled about, uh, with this, because I grew up in northern Wisconsin, I went to the University of Wisconsin, and everybody I went to school with, it was just like, uh, we were either Scandinavian, German, or Polish, and there was no real distinction between the cultures. Uh, you know, so with very few exceptions, there were a few, my um, freshman roommate was Irish and that seemed exotic, except for she grew up in La Crosse, Wisconsin, so it was more <laughs> of just the same. Um, but then uh, I moved to Wheeling and all of a sudden I was like, oh, I understand now, I, I, I have a culture because uh, this, is, this is a city of immigrants with very distinct cultures, um, just not Norwegian cultures. <laughs> So, um, you know, for the first time I was looking outside rather than being somebody on the inside trying to, to look out. And I finally realized that I did have my own culture. Um, and moving to Wheeling is great as all everybody is and as friendly as this city is. Um, and as much as I fell in love with it, I still culturally uh, felt really alone here. Um, so this 
this chart that you see here, um, it's from the, the archives here at the library. It shows the foreign-born populations of greater healing from 1870 to 1930. So you can see so lots, of, lots of Germans, lots of Irish. We've got Italians, Polish, Austrians. Um, there is a tiny little thing for Swiss, but no Norwegians there. There is even tinier other countries at the very bottom. There might be one or two Norwegians in that. So um, I looked at the 1900 census to see how many Norwegians lived, not just in Mule, but in the entire state of West Virginia in 1900. So um, any guesses? More than zero. But I heard something from the back. No, 10's closer. <laughs> There were 19. 19 Norwegians reported on the 1900 census in the entire state of West Virginia. Um, I think there are more people in this graphic than there were in West Virginia at the time. <laughs> so um, we just had another census taken two years ago. According to the 2020 census, Wheeling's population is now down to 27,460 residents. So any guesses at the percentage of Norwegians that were were reported on that four wheeling in that census. Less than 19. You. <laughs> More than 19, but if you just put, if you put a dot in front of that 19, it's 0.19% of the population has, uh, as a Norwegian reported themselves as Norwegian descent. So that's about 50 people. So whoever the other 49 of you are, contact me and we'll get together next uh, set in the mine. Okay, so a Norse history of Wheeling. At this point, um, you're probably thinking one of two things. The first one is that really, um, and to give, to answer that, we get back to that title slide, which is yeah, sort of. <laughs> um, and to explain that to you, I'm, uh, I am going to share a little bit of my culture here. Um, something that I know better how to iterate than I did for that paper. Um, something that I understand better now. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Norse culture. Uh, because moving here, it was the first time I'd ever experienced culture shock. And there are little, I guess with the Scandinavian culture, maybe it's the cold, I don't know. But, um, there's a very subtle body language and um, language language that uh, you might call it Minnesota nice, where you communicate with each other and it has these very subtle meanings. And I came here and I'm, I'm using these tactics and they're just not working. And I, <laughs> I didn't understand. So um, yeah, it, was, it took me a while to figure out how uh, to, to change my behaviors here because that was part of that hidden culture that I didn't realize I had. Um, but I'm not gonna talk about that today. I'm gonna talk about something else in Norse culture and that is uh, stoic humor. And that's, it's not an oxymoron for those of you who might think so. So this stoicism, uh, it recognizes that life is tough and you just kind of have to take it for what it is. And it's a, a grin and bear it mentality. And uh, my Norwegian grandma, who I have some pictures of her up here, she's a sweetheart, but she used to tell me all the time, if, if uh, if horses were, or if wishes were horses, beggar would, beggars would ride. And um, then there was the ever more popular, there's no use crying over spilt milk, which, you know, when you grow up in Wisconsin, is very popular saying. <laughs> um, but getting back to that stoicism, even though it has its roots in ancient Greece, it's really a philosophy that Scandinavians, I think, by necessity, have embraced. Uh, life above the Arctic Circle is not ideal. Uh, the winter, winters are long and dark and bleak. So this uh, photograph here, for instance, beautiful photograph, but this is sunset at 2.30 in the afternoon after the sunset or the sun had risen at 10.30 uh, in the morning. So you get about three to four hours of sunlight in mid-January. Uh, there are nasty storms. There's a lot of snow. <laughs> and uh, despite all of this, Scandinavian countries consistently rank in the top 10 happiest countries in the world. And um, I think if you go back to that idea of not, not crying over spilled milk, it's kind of that you're, you're gonna laugh or you're gonna cry mentality. And if you can't do anything about it, you might as well laugh. 
So when you live in these harsh environments, you've got to learn to laugh, and this stoic humor plays a large part in that happiness factor, uh, in my opinion. Um, it tends to be very self-depreciative. Uh, I use very dry wit to poke fun at oneself and in one's environment and sort of the absurdities in life. Um, but it's it's very playful. And uh, again, you think Minnesota Knives, if anybody's watched the movie Fargo, um, you think of that dark, dry humor, but it's still playful. Um, so that's the best way I can I can explain it. And if you're wondering about those accents in the movie, they're real. That is what my parents uh, in their generation still sound like today. And when I go home, it's hilarious because I, I've lost a lot of it, but it's still funny to hear. Okay. So this type of humor is documented all the way back to the Viking Age. It may have preceded that, but we don't have any written uh, tradition from before that. So uh, times are really tough before the discovery of oil in the 1960s when that brought all the wealth and the universal health care and the free education and everything that we associate with the Scandinavian countries today. Um, so in the Icelandic sagas, which were written about 1200 AD and then some of the earlier Norse documents, we find examples of this humor. And um, one of the examples are the Viking nicknames. So when you have a patriarchal naming so uh, society, so you have somebody like Lars Larsen, um, which is literally Lund, uh, Lars, the son of Lars, uh, there's not a lot of distinction. Uh, you have you know, Lars Olsen, you have Lars uh, Carlson, etc. So they're just, there's, uh, a lot of people with the same name. So these nicknames were ways to differentiate one Lars Larson from another. And some of them were very straightforward, but a lot of them had uh, elements of humor to them. So I'll give you some examples here. Um, so this guy here, he might have been, um, he might have been called Torvid the Meek, while this guy would have been Bjorn the Intimidating. Um, and then you'd have Eric the fair hair, or maybe Eric the short, and the, well, this guy might have been Olaf of the giants. You know, um, and then here we have Ivor the all seeing you know, because he's lost an eye. And uh, women, if you were wondering, were not excluded from this roasting. Recorded in the ninth and tenth century book of settlements were, among others, Astrid Wisdom Slope, uh, Halgard Twisted Bridges, and Thora Moss Neck. Um, so this humor didn't extend just into nicknames, um, it's also, you know, um, some of the, the quips that people made. So in the saga of Greta Osman Darson, it was reported that a man having just been stabbed right through the chest, uh, looks down at the spear in his chest and looks up at his hacker and said, you know, I've heard that these wide spears are all the fashion today, and then drops that immediately on the spot. Um, not, oh, you know, he's, you know, it's just, I can't imagine having a spear in my chest and just being like, oh, yeah, I've heard these are fashion. Um, but then there's also uh, another story uh, in these sagas where a uh, attacker has just cut off somebody's leg and the guy's looking down where his leg used to be and, and the, his attacker says, there's no use of looking at it, it's gone. Uh, so, you know, it's the, you can see that it's dark, but it's playful um, and it, it's humorous. And so we still have these sort of this this uh, humor today, but it's a little less dark. Um, so to answer the question, really, um, yes, yeah, sort of. So I'm being playful here when I say that this is a Norse history of wheeling. Um, so. The next question that you might have asked is, well, if there are, if there is no Norse history of wheeling, then why are you doing this program? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I say the better question is, why am I doing the program today? Uh, so when I saw that May 17th fell on a Tuesday today, or this year, uh, on lunch with Books Day, I ran to Sean and I said, Sean, I gotta do a program on Norse history of wheeling today. And he said, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> and then he said, well, you know, I was kind of thinking I was going to do a program on baseball for the spring opener. But I hounded him, he said, finally said, okay. So, yeah, I'm sorry to steal your spot, Sean, but um, I did find a little baseball tie-in. 
Um, so this is one of my great aunts who played baseball for the Minnesota Valkyries in the 19 aughts. Um, no, it's not really. But look at that. <laughs> That's me from a couple of years ago when we had a tin type photographer here for Arts Fest. Um, but here is a photo of my grandpa Mold. He's uh, the, the one on the end there, and this is his ragtag baseball team up in Wisconsin. Um, depression era. So here are some Norwegians playing baseball, and you get a little bit of your baseball program here, Sean. Okay, but not to get sidetracked, why did I want to supersede Sean's program for a sort of history on the Norwegians in Wheeling today? And the answer is that today is Setna de Mai. Um, it's a national holiday in Norway, and for those of you, as Sean mentioned, uh, those of you who remember when he decided he thought he was going to be, or he briefly entertained the idea of being a lawyer, uh, I became the new Sean. And if you've seen the promotion for today, I don't know who made it, but the promotion for today, uh, that was a photo that was taken at the very first program that I booked as the, the head of adult programming here at the Ohio County Public Library. And that first program that I booked was called Reinventing the Vikings with Viking expert Darren Cox from West Liberty University. And I asked him to do that program because the first date that I had to fill when I took over was, it was not May 17th, but it was May 16th, which is close enough for me to call it a Setna de Mai program. Um, so uh, what is Setna de Mai? It commemorates the signing of the Norwegian constitution in 1814. Um, it didn't give Norway true independence, but after 400 years of being ruled by the Danes, uh, the country was ceded to Sweden. And Norway didn't end up uh, separating from Sweden until 1905, but it did mark the starting point for democracy and independent rule in Norway. So it is still a big, ce oops, a big celebration. I'm going back there. There, big celebration in, um, in Norway today. Uh, it's, it's much like the 4th of July here in America. Everybody wears red, white, and blue. Um, and instead of calling it Constitution, Constitution Day, they actually call it by the date of the, um, the, the actual date. So it set the mind literally translates into the 17th of May. Um, so now you might say, why are we celebrating a Norwegian holiday in America in a city of Point less than 0.2 percent Norwegian descent, no less. Um, and so again, the answer to that that question is the same as Wheeling's history. It's about this process of immigration and passing cultures on from generation to generation. Um, so Norwegians weren't quick to immigrate to America. Um, the first few came in 1825. There were uh, religious pilgrims, um, a small group of Quakers who were seeking religious freedom. Um, and by 1850, there were only about 13,000 Norwegians in America, counted on the census. Or the uh, first wave didn't start coming over until the steamboats came into fashion in the 1860s. And I know what you're thinking, the Norse are supposed to be excellent sailors. But sails over the Atlantic were still a bit harrowing before the steamships. So um, in the mid to late 1860s and into the early 1870s, there was a terrible famine in Sweden and, and Norway and um, mass immigration followed in that time. So here's uh, you know, a big article that ran in a California newspaper. It's pretty typical um, to see in the newspapers these, uh, these articles about the famine in Sweden and Norway. Um, here's what I found in the, in the Wheeling newspapers. I found exactly one half of one sentence in one paper <laughs> that covers the famine in Sweden and Norway. So you can see even back in the 1860s, um, this, uh, the Scandinavian countries were not on, on Wheeling's radar at all. Um, so this sentence comes from a congressional report from Washington, D.C. that was reported in the Intelligencer. Uh, in the latter part of the 1870s, following that famine, uh, Norway experienced a population boom. And uh, when you have a country that's very mountainous with very few habitable areas and then even less farmland and you have a population boom, you're going to have uh, issues again. So we saw another wave of, of immigration start in 1877. Um, then an economic depression hit the country, so even more Norwegians were coming in the 1880s, and that's when my great-grandparents came over. 
Um, so by the 1880s, so by 1880, one ninth of Norway's population had emigrated and left the country. And uh, by the time the Immigration Act of 1924 started, um, started putting border, you know, the, the borders up in the United States, approxim it's approximated that one quarter to one third of the population of Norway had left and 800,000 had immigrated to America. And much like the immigrants to Wheeling, they brought their cultures with them and Setna Dubai is one of them. Um, so the first recorded celebration of Setna Dubai in the U.S. was in Seattle. That was in 1889. Today, Seattle has the third largest Setna Dubai celebration in the country or in the, the entire world, only behind Oslo and Bergen. Um, so the celebration in, in my neck of the woods is a little bit smaller. So this is a picture of my mom and son of her fellow Sons of Norway Lodge members in the basement of the Lutheran Church this past weekend playing Norwegian bingo to win Setna de Mai prizes of butter, lefse, and pickled herring. And I'm sorry, Mom, but you posted it on Facebook. It's fair game. Um, <laughs> so my hometown, I should say, is, is less than 2.2% of the size of Seattle. So regardless of the gathering size, Setna de Mai is still celebrated um, across the country in celebrations large and small. And today, you get to be a part of one. So. Um, Thank you all for coming. Um, if you want to know what we do for Sutton de Mai, uh, usually it involves wearing red, white, and blue. So I see a few of you got the uh, the memo. Um, it uh, you tell some good Norwegian jokes, which we will have, and then you eat some good Norwegian. Or you eat, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said good. You eat some Norwegian food, sometimes regrettably. Um, I, <laughs> I have uh, brought some krumkaka, which is a Norwegian dessert, and uh, Mary Ann and Julia will be handing those out at the end of the program. For those of you who want to try it, it's, uh, it's basically a, a, a Norwegian uh, cannoli, is that what you said? It's just a, it's a waffle with, filled with cream and lingonberry uh, jam. So, well, no, Mary Ann, not yet. <laughs> not till the end of the program. But I wanted to give you uh, the, the full Setna de Mai experience. Um, so wait for that at the end of the program. Um, so back home, I am part of the, uh, the Dover Lodge of Sons of Norway. That is not one of the jokes. That is an actual organization that exists. Uh, but I can't be there today, so I'm celebrating Setna de Mai with you. Um, I'm giving you back something that I've enjoyed sharing with you over the years, which is going to all of your cultural fests. Um, and that's the real reason why I'm doing this program today. So now, here we are finally, um, getting to the meat and potatoes of the program, or the, the cotton potatoes if you're Scandinavian, um, of this program, which is the Norse history of wheeling. Um, but first, as I said, it's not set into mind without a few, uh, a little bit of humor. And I can't really celebrate this holiday without thinking of my grandparents and my great aunts and uncles sitting around the, the, uh, the kitchen table telling each other jokes in Norwegian and just laughing until they had tears rolling down their eyes. And then we'd say, well, you know, what's, what's the joke? What's so funny? And then they would, they would tell it to us in English and it would just, <laughs> it just wouldn't translate. And then they would laugh because we weren't laughing. And then we would laugh because they were laughing at us and it was, it was just a lot of fun. And I really miss that. Um, so to indoctrinate you all to Setna Mai, I'm going to introduce you to these guys. These, this, this is Oli and Sven. Uh, has anybody ever heard of Oli and Sven? Yeah, a few people here. Okay, so basically there are two modern, I saw hand through the kitchen there. There are two modern day Norwegian American, to, to put it bluntly, they're two modern day idiots. Um, <laughs> The tradition of Oli and Sven and, and Oli's uh, wife, Lena, it goes back to the 1920s and 1930s. It's inherently uh, American, a Norwegian-American tradition. Um, and I don't know if you noticed it before when we were talking about the, the Ludifus dinners, but um, there was one actually named after Oli and Lena there that I found uh, near where I grew up. Um, and I, I did recently see an article where they've named uh, a variety of rows Oli and Lena as well. So, you know, like it's very, very popular back home. And um, 
One thing about these jokes is that you can't tell them without channeling uh, your grandparents. Um, so these are these are my grandparents here. Uh, that's my grandma and my step grandpa, and neither one of them spoke English until or learned how to speak English until they went to school. So they just and my uh, biological grandfather as well. So they just have these cute, cute accents. And when you hear an old and Lena joke, you can't help but hear that in there. So um, despite how stern they thought they were really sweet people, um, both of them. Uh, so God willing, I'm gonna try to do them justice and, and share some Oli and, and Sven and Oli and Lena jokes here. Uh, between each segment of my Norwegian-based history, just to, uh, for nothing else, fill some time. <laughs> okay. So Oli and Sven are talking one day and they decide they're going to take a trip to Wheeling, West Virginia. And Sven says, if we fly from Minneapolis to Pittsburgh, then drive the rest of the way, uh, it, it won't take us too long to get there. And uh, Oli says, well, yeah, but it's going to be expensive. <laughs> what, what, what if we just take the bus? And Sven says, oh, I don't know. Uh, that's going to take a long time. I don't want to be on the bus all day and all night. And Oli says, oh, I won't take that long to take the bus. And they bigger back and forth. And finally, they decide, OK, we're going to call Greyhound, and we're going to see how long it's going to take the bus, or how long it's going to take to get to Wheeling. So they call the, the line, and the woman, uh, a woman picks up, and they say, yeah, how long will it take to, to, to how long does it take the bus to get from Minneapolis to Wheeling? And then they hear, here are typing, here click enter, and she says, just one minute. And Sven looks at Oli and says, well, Oli, if it's only going to take a minute, there's no use in spending money on the flight for the plane. So now, I didn't know if it was going to get groans or laughs. So, so you get a little bit of, of, of a taste of Sven and Oli there. Okay. So, for our, our first uh, uh, bit of Norse history um, in Wheeling, and I'm, I'm using that very loosely, like I'm using the term history of Norse history very loosely, um, we're going to go to uh, the greater Wheeling area, and we're going to go down to Moundsville. And that's where our, our little Viking is down here in Moundsville. So, everyone here should be familiar with Grave Creek Mountain in Moundsville. Uh, Great Creek Mound is the largest of the Indina uh, burial mounds, having been constructed between two, or, yeah, 250 and, 200, or, and 150 BC. Uh, the mound was first excavated in 1838 by amateurs, which is exactly who you want um, excavating things when you're dealing with uh, cultural sites of national importance. Um, so these excavators found Native American relics and several human skeletons in the mound. Um, some reports said that they had found a giant skeletons that were as long as eight foot tall in there. So now I have read the original accounts of what they did find, and that's that's um, just a rumor. They, there were no eight foot tall skeletons in there. But I did um, uh, what I did find in the re account was that they were just referred to as common human remains. However, uh, throughout the 1800s, as other amateur excavators began to explore other mounds, these so-called legitimate reports began to surface of uh, very large skeletal remains. Um, seven, a seven-foot skeleton was found in Charleston in 1883 and another one in 1884. In Portsmouth, Ohio, a seven-foot, four-inch tall skeleton was uncovered in 1895. Uh, the Adena Mound in Chilcothy, excavated in 1901, uncovered similar skeletons. And there was even one found here in Wheeling in 1858. Uh, there's the by Sheriff Wickham in a vineyard in East Wheeling. There's the newspaper report here. Um, these have continued to be found in modern times. In 1958, archaeologists from the Carnegie Museum unearthed a seven foot skeleton at Crescent Mound, about 10 miles south of Moundsville. Um, so it's reported that the average Adena male um, was to be about five foot six. So where did these giant skeletons come from? Um, some believe that they might be attributed to a genetic disorder like gigantism. Others attribute these skeletons to being um, just aggrandizations of eager journalists. Um, 
I, however, I have a theory, and um, those of you who are of Italian-American descent, I'm sorry, you're not going to like what I'm going to say next. <laughs> sorry, very bad. Um, no, so everybody knows who this guy is, right? Every, everybody who celebrates Leif Erikson Day on, on October 9th, right? You all yes. celebrate yes. Yeah. So we all know, uh, we were taught in elementary school that Leif Erikson from Norway was the first European recorded to have discovered um, America. And he landed in Newfoundland in Canada in the 10th century AD. So like I said, this is the first recorded discoverer uh, European discoverer of America. So my theory is that Nordic people came much earlier unrecorded. And uh, I'll tell you why. Um, so there's a, a book called The Old, Old World Roots of the Cherokee that traces the, um, the, the origins of the Cherokee people and it follows their migrations from the west to the east into um, what became their homeland in the lower Appalachian Mountains. Um, the traditions speak of fighting with a race of giant white men during these, uh, these movements east past the Mississippi as they were moving east. Uh, the giants were said to have wielded swords and axes, to be excellent fishermen, and were said to have had seafaring, mathematical, and engineering knowledge, which you would have needed to have crossed the Atlantic, and that they also left inscriptions on artifacts which were buried with their dead. So this will become important in my next segment. Um, the Cherokee descendants also said that the, the, the mounds that were left behind were the remnants of these giant's fortresses. Um, so this photo that you see here uh, is a picture uh, from Newfoundland at a UNESCO World uh, Heritage Site um, near where Leif Erikson and his crew was supposed to have landed. Uh, behind the boat is a replica of Viking sod house. So I don't know about you, but that looks a bit like a mound to me. So I'm just saying, um, it's a theory. It's a very flimsy, unfounded, unscientific theory, uh, but it's a theory no less that these skeletons were ancient Viking giants and that the mounds were the remnants of their south houses. So with that, it's time for another Oli and, Lina, or Oli and Sven joke. Um, so Oli and Sven have been in Wheeling uh, and they've been staying at the McClure hotel for two weeks and they decide that they like it here so much that they they want to move here and stay here so Oli puts in an offer on a house and it's accepted and they go to the house they meet the real estate agent there to sign the papers and uh Oli he finishes signing the papers he says well that's done and then Sven looks at him and he says well, what about Lena Lena's Oli's wife and he says oh yeah yeah I better write a letter um, so he grabs paper and he starts looking for a pen and he says, I just had a pen. I don't know what I did. Maybe I'll put it in the boxes. So he's looking in the boxes for the pen. And Sven looks around and he sees a pen sitting on the real estate agent's briefcase. And he says, hey Sven, I found a pen. Is this yours? And Sven says, or well, he says, well, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure. Let me see it. Let me see it. I'll give it a try. And so he writes something with it. He says, oh, yeah, yeah, that's mine. And Sven says, but it says Century 21 on it. Are you sure it's yours? He says, but that's my handwriting, so it must be my handwriting. <laughs> so in that last section, I mentioned that the giants were known to, were said to have left inscriptions on artifacts which were buried with their dead. So that takes us back to Grave Creek Mound. Uh, now, even though there were no giant skeletons found there in the mound, uh, in 1938, what was purported to have been found was the Grave Creek stone tablet. Uh, now there have been many attempted transcriptions of the stone. Uh, some people think they're glyphs, possibly marking um, where the North Pole sits. Other things, other people think it might be ancient Iberian. Um, one one uh, account said it, they think it's that it says the mound raised on high for the deceased this tile his queen caused to be made. And then others still think it shows uh, locations um, you turn it sideways, uh, it shows latitude and longitude, but you know, Greenwich wasn't uh, really established as your latitude and longitude until the 1880s, so I'm not sure how that worked out. Um, but I, however, happen to think it shares a lot in common with the Viking runic alphabet. You can see some of, some of the, the letters look very common there. Um, and I did find one uh, source, one 
kind of dubious source that did say that they, they thought it was Iberian, but written by a Finnish sailor. So I don't know how you would get that. Um, uh, so I don't know what it would say in Old Norse. However, uh, most scholars do agree that it says, do not fall for this. It's clearly a hoax planted by the amateur excavators the mom for publicity. Um, I, I like to think that there might be an alternative translation that says, happy setting in line, here's another Ori and Sven joke for you. <laughs> so Ori's bought this house and he decides he's going to paint it and make it look real nice for when Lena gets there. So Sven comes over and he looks up and Ori's on the ladder painting away and he says, Ori, it's 75 degrees today. Why are you wearing your winter jacket? And Ori says, well, I read the directions on the can and it said put on two coats. Uh, There's a groan. I finally got a groan. Okay. So this time we are moving. We're, we're moving into wheeling, and we're going to fast forward into the 1860s to 1890s. Okay. And uh, we're going to. It actually takes place right here in the library's backyard, right over here. Um, so this is another photo from the library's archives. It's from the W. C. Brown collection. Um, this one was taken in 1888 when the first stone bridge that crosses Wheeling Creek on Main Street collapsed. You can see the bridge there, um, but that has nothing to do with Norse uh, history in Wheeling. Why I'm showing this picture today is because this is the only photo I've ever been able to find that has this building in it right here. Um, and that does have to do with Norse Wheeling history. Uh, so. That is right here, where the Norway Tat Manufacturing Company, where the, or the Norway Iron Manufacturing Company sat. So the, the yellow part is where we are here. That's the library. This is West Virginia Northern, and that is where the old bus station was, um, and that's where the, the Norway Tat Company was. And when I first came across this, um, you know, after working in the archives for years, I got so excited because. Um, at that point, I had been in Wheeling for over a decade, and I'd never seen one Nor Norwegian connection <laughs> in that whole time. Um, so, uh, in 1867, uh, Intelligencer article, a uh, reporter actually toured the plant, and he stated, In our rambles through the manufacturing portion, portion of our city yesterday, we visited the Norway Iron Manufacturing Company's works, which are eligibly located near the creek and are bounded by Market, Zane, and Fourth Streets. Um, so not only was, in that's today, uh, 18th Street, uh, Oak Street, and Market is the same, uh, if you were wondering. Uh, so not only was there a wheeling, a, a Norwegian wheeling connection, but it was right here where I work in my backyard of the library. Um, so the Norway Iron Manufacturing Company was organized in 1865, incorporated as the Norway Tech Company, and shortly thereafter they changed their name to the Norway Iron Manufacturing Company, because, quote, the latter being more comprehensive as it was found desirable to add other manufacturers to that of tax, which is probably great because I can't imagine how many uses you have for tax. Um, they first started advertising the wheeling newspapers in 1865, the company produced, quote, all kinds, sizes, and varieties of tack, shoe, finishing, Hungarian clout, barrel, fine 2D and 3D nails, also machine forged nails, uh, I'm sorry, machine forged nuts, machine plow, car, and truck bolts, and washers, besides doing a fine business in the way of job machine works and blacksmithing. So, you know, it was, had a lot going on. Um, it also had one of the few distinctions of being uh, being one of the very few factories that had women on its payroll. Uh, the only other factory in town that had more women working for it was the Raymond Brewery. Uh, so um, kind of a, a forward thinking company here. Uh, History of the Panhandle written in 1879 stated they had, uh, they manufactured some 500 lengths, sizes and varieties of tacks and nails none of them exceeding two inches or being cut nails such as are produced at our other local nail works. Um, but it did say that it made the distinction of uh, really solidifying Wheeling's uh, claim to be nail city because the, it added that from the cut nail, also these other little brads and tacks that were not cut nails. Um, 
Um, and an Intel report did say that uh, they have a shoe nail machine that, that acquired curiosity, making 700 revolutions in a minute and throwing out the spare balls out in a stream. So I just imagine these tiny little little uh, attacks coming out at a, 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 just a huge rate. Okay, so this is the Mercantile Agency annual uh, ad for 1877. And the reason I put this up here, or 1871. The reason I put it up here is because when I found this, I started looking into who are the incorporators, who are the foremen, who are these Norwegians who came and made this company in Wheeling. And as you can see here, the president, his name is Corrier, and the secretary's name is Dietrich. Um, also found Dewey, Davis, Finney, Jones, Lewis. Not a single name that was remotely Scandinavian. So then I was thinking, well, why is it called Norway Iron Manufacturing? And then I found this one sentence that said, at present, the company uses almost exclusively Norway iron. <laughs> so it has nothing to do uh, with Norwegians. It's just it has to do with the iron. And um, if you're wondering what Norway, like I was, what is Norway iron? Believe it or not, it's iron that's made in Norway. Um, <laughs> An article from Popular Science Monthly, uh, December 17th, explained iron made in Norway owes its fine qualities to the exceptional purity of the ores from which it is made and the care taken in its manufacture. Um, the metal has a purity of 99.8% iron and it's very low in sulfur and phosphorus, the two ingredients which modern manufacturers strive to keep as low as possible. Sulfur makes iron brittle when hot, thus causing it to break in rolls. Phosphorus, on the other hand, makes iron brittle when cold and interferes with its strength and ductility in bending. Norway iron, on account of its exceptional purity, has come to be recognized as the world standard to which the quality of all other irons is compared. Um, so again, the only thing that has anything to do with Norway in this factory is the iron that it uses, um, but I will take that. <laughs> but then, uh, but the weight. So here's a listing from Wiggins and Weaver's uh, Ohio River Directory for 1871-72. And you see both Norway Iron Manufacturing Company and Norway Tack Company are listed on here. And under Norway Tack Company, it says, manufacturers of extra Swedes and common <coughs> tacks. So uh, then I found another article in Scientific American. This was published in 1868. Norway Tack Company, Wheeling, West Virginia. Employs 45 hands, uses 20 Blanchard machines, seven reed machines, two vibrators, and one machine for making hog head brads, which together produce over 3 million tacks per day. For this work, one third Swede and two thirds best quality American iron is used. So now we have a company named after Norway using Swedish and American steel. And, uh, even Merriam-Webster's Dictionary of Norway Iron didn't give me much comfort. It says it's a high grade of wrought iron produced in Sweden, but usually finished and exported from Norway. Um, so my one connection to Norway turns out to be not much of a connection at all. Um, so what happened to the Norway uh, Tack Company? So as I mentioned before, Mr. Courier uh, was the the president of the manufacturing company, and he's not listed here in 1971 under the iron manufacturing company anymore. Oh yeah, he is there. Okay. Well, he wouldn't be there for long because he was also the treasurer of the Wheeling Savings Institution, and he happened to embezzle large sums of money uh, through the Norway Iron Manufacturing Company. Um, so I think Norway Tack started up to take well well they were going through the lawsuits and the norway tack eventually uh, absorbed wheeling iron or norway ironing manufacturing company um eventually the land that they this factory sat on was taken um uh, taken by the city to build a train station so the uh the TAC company was sold by eminent domain in a condemnation proceeding in January 21st, 1891. The settlement allowed the factory to continue occupying the property for six months, and then they began dismantling their equipment in mid-July, and de demolition uh, began soon after um, in that area there. Uh, soon after they left, they were the last ones to leave the block, and that is um, St. John's an evangelical church, which is now on the corner of 22nd and uh, Market Street for Chaplin. 
Um, so that was also torn down for this uh, this train depot. Um, and there, there's the uh, the condemnation suit that they tried to fight and lost. Um, so interest, interestingly enough, they didn't tear down the whole building. Um, the, uh, they tore it off the top story of the office building and put a new roof on it to turn it into the terminal depot for the Wheeling and Lake Erie Railroad. Um, so you still see the remnants of of the office building there. Um, the July 31st, 19, 1891 newspaper says that the company relocated to Norristown, uh, Pennsylvania. So this building here was removed in the bus terminal, as I said, was built on the former grounds in 1946. So unfortunately, uh, there is nothing left of the Norway Iron Manufacturing or Hack Company anymore, but um, Sean is so great at finding things. He did find me a little uh, receipt from the Norway, uh, the Norway Tap Company here in Wheeling. So you can come up and see that after the program if you want. Okay, so it's time for another Oli and Sven joke. Um, it was kind of a sad story, so this will hopefully cheer us up. Okay, so the house that Oli uh, Oli bought was in Center Wheeling, and Sven is at this point. He's living in East Wheeling, so. Sven calls Oli up and he says, hey, let's go fishing in Wheeling Creek. And uh, Oli says, okay, I'll meet you in the parking lot of the West Virginia Northern, uh, where the, the old Norway tack factory was, used to be. And Sven says, okay, see you then. And so Oli's coming up Market Street and he sees a sign that says bridge out. And, he just see, and then he's looking around, he sees Sven's already on the other side of the bank, on the north side of the bank, and he's already fishing. So he shouts out, he says, hey, Sven, the bridge is out. And Sven says, yeah, and well, he says, but how am I going to get to the other side? And Sven thinks about it and he says, well, Oli, I think you're already on the other side. <laughs> okay. okay, so next we're going to move a little bit further outside of Greater Wheeling. We're going to move, uh, this one was uh, for a, a nod to our, our our current director, um, Amy Castigar, who just took over. This is her neck of the woods, and it's uh, it's we're going to New Martinsville. And I was going to ask any guesses why, but I see Fred Fred Austin here, so I know he knows why. Any anybody other uh, have any anybody else know why we're going to New Martinsville? Because it's the home of the Viking Glass Company. <laughs> and when I came across the Viking Glass Company, I thought. Well, there's got to be a great story to behind this, um, and I was sure there was, but I just couldn't find one. So, <laughs> so I asked Fred, who is a, he's the uh, president, if you don't know Fred, he's the president of the Imperial Glass Collector Society, and he's just a general expert on Ohio Valley glass, um, and he's also got a great uh, last, uh, Scandinavian name. <laughs> is that, I know you told me, but is it Norwegian or is it's it's, yeah, I thought it was Swedish, but uh, you're, you're an honorary, honorary uh, setting in my person today. Okay, so I asked him, I said, why was it called Viking Glass? And he said to me that he, the prevailing theory is that the company thought it sounded more marketable than New Martinsville Glass Manufacturing Company. Uh, was that, did I get that right? <laughs> And what I could find backs up that theory. Um, so the New Martinsville Glass Manufacturing Company was established in 1901. In its early years, it produced perfume bottles, vanity jars, dresser sets, lamps, smoking and liquor sets. Um, and then in 1923, the company uh, began making more distinctive colored and decorative glass, where I am not an expert. I'm just getting this off from the information that I found. Um, so Fred could probably tell you better off after the program. Um, and then beginning in around 1940, they began to concentrate on modernizing the glassworks and created a handmade glassware that they called the Swedish type. Um, so again, I'm foiled by the Norwegian um, connection here, uh, but this Swedish type, they began running ads for their new lines under the name Viking Glass by New Martinsville. And it uh, said that it went over so well that in June of 1944, the stockholders voted to change the name of the company to Viking Glass. Sorry, that's my phone and I forgot to silence it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, and there's some of the, the early glassware and then this is that, that more Swedish type glassware. Um, so according to the book Mid-Century Glass in America, 
quote, Viking was one of the largest and most prolific producers of American glass that embodied the mid-century modern aesthetic. Uh, by 1980, however, the company was struggling amid the recession, and it was purchased in 1984 by Kenneth Dalzell, who was the uh, fourth generation Dalzell from the uh, Fostoria Glass Company. Uh, but the company couldn't compete with the cheap imports and uh, had to close its doors in 1998. So unfortunately, the, the old factory building was demolished in January of 2013. So there we go, another sad story. So uh, let's have another old <laughs> spend joke. Um, so well, he's got his house painted and Sabina's in town now and she needs to get a job. So she goes down to Kaufman's and she gets a job there. And uh, it's prom season, you know, it's, we're in May, it's prom season, and all the girls are out shopping for their dresses. And so this young high schooler comes up to Lena and she asks, uh, you know, can I try that, that, that dress on there in the window? And Lena says, well, I don't know. We really prefer you try the dresses on in the dressing room. <laughs> So, you know, uh, I, I made that one specifically about high schoolers, and any guesses why I, I tried to pull high schoolers into this one, besides the fact that the Bel Air of uh, uh, high school is here. I see some hands. No guesses. Just, just high school. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Um, well, because next we're going to go to Warwood. Uh, and Warwood is the home of the, yeah, the Vikings. Um, so now for this one, I was going to go to Chuck Wood. Um, if anybody knows Chuck, he's a librarian. He used to be on the board here at the Ohio County Public Library. Uh, he's also an expert on all things Warwood. So, you know, I thought surely Chuck's going to know why they're called the Warwood Vikings. Um, but before I could even ask him, he sent an email to Sean asking Sean if there was any record anywhere in the library about why they were called the Warwood Vikings. And so Sean asked me and said, if I know, and I said, no, I don't know. I was going to ask Chuck. So, so here we are. Um, does anybody here know why they're called the Warwood Vikings? No, shoot. <laughs> so, OK, so well, I tried to figure it out, and here's what I could ascertain. Um, it started exactly where you would expect it to do. In Center Wheeling, uh, where Ole now lives. Um, Center Wheeling, known for its German, Greek, and Lebanese churches. Um, however, the, the Center Grade Schools team from 1932 to 1937, uh, they were called the Vikings. Uh, it, it's, it, and it's the last mention of them in the newspapers in 1937. And it's around that time um, that those mentions of the Center Vikings disappear, that the, the mentions of the Warwood Vikings first appear. Um, so the first mention uh, of the Warwood Vikings is in July of 1938. Um, however, there's no explanation anywhere for why either one of them chose the name Vikings. Uh, but it does seem like the center, uh, center Vikings migrated to, to Warwood uh, at this time. So and, and they just magic the, the name, the mascot just magically appeared overnight. Um, so I went to the yearbooks trying, hoping that I could find more of an answer. And there was no such odd. Um, so the Richmond District High School opened its doors in 1918, and the name was changed to Warwood High School in 1920. So prior to 1938, in the newspapers, um, the Warwood teams were just called Warwood. They didn't have any uh, any mascot at all. And the uniforms in the yearbooks, um, which I've, I've set several of them out here, they reflected that. They just said Warwood across the chest. Um, and there was no visible. Uh, mascot mentioned anywhere in these in these yearbooks um, but the yearbooks themselves uh, they're all called they're all called the warrior um, and you can see here there's a, a it's, it's kind of vikingish but he's got a winged helmet um, which is roman <laughs> it's more um, you know mercury and hermes so uh, or the the winged helmets the the vikings uh are depicted with the horns, but uh, that's not, they were, this is, this is not a Viking helmet, uh, but they were more, it, it, it's a stand-in because I forgot to bring one. Um, so thank you, Carl. But they were more like this with no horns on them at all. Um, so, 
eventually the yearbooks start calling the team the Warwood Warriors. Um, oh, and um, I, I did want to say that Wikipedia, the fine scholarly source that everybody should use for their, for their talks, uh, told me that in the 19th century, winged helmets did become widely used to depict the Celts, but not the Norse. Um, so that might explain why the green and white uh, colors. But um, so there, there's that picture of the, the winged, the winged helmet warrior. Um, then in one of the yearbooks, this is the only time I found an actual depiction of any kind of mascot. It's just it's kind of, it's hard to tell what's going on. It's hard to see like this guy's, uh, if he's Roman or if he's, he's Scandinavian or if he's just a barbarian. Um, but by this time they were being called the warriors. Um, but interesting enough, in, in this particular yearbook, they did start using, um, oh yeah, this, this is the football team where they, you can see it's called the War One Warriors at this point, but at the bottom of the page, this is the first uh, depiction of any, anything remotely Scandinavian in these yearbooks. Um, so in 1938, they were still called the Warriors, and this is when they, the first uh, mentions of it start coming in the, the newspapers of them being called the Vikings. And then by the next year, 1940, you see here, uh, City Champs, the Viking Gritters, um, thought for sure somewhere in this yearbook it's going to tell why they changed their name to the Vikings. No, no absolutely no explanation. Um, then we fast forward to 1955. This is the first depiction of, of more of that, that Scandinavian Viking here um, that shows up. Um, but the horns still almost look like wings at this point. And then it's not until 1967 that the word Vikings actually show up on, on any of the uniforms instead of uh, Warwood. So theories on why, they, since they didn't tell anybody why they, they chose the Vikings, here's uh, the theories. So I think Warwood Warriors is a bit of a tongue twister. Um, so all you have to do, you don't have to change that, that character much. You just change the wings into horns and you have a Viking. Um, and then you also have the World War II company, which was uh, the, the town was named after, and their primary product, it looks an awful lot like a hammer that a Norse god wears. So I think that's as good of an explanation as I'm going to be able to give you on why they're called the Vikings. Um, so honestly, at this point, I do have just a tiny bit more really uh, Norse history that I can share for you. Um, for instance, in 1926, there was a radio program called the Vikings that uh, played on the airwaves. Um, in 1930s, there was a Viking orchestra based out of Mecken that played for social functions like uh, St. Patrick's Day, um, good, good Scandinavian holidays. Um, didn't last long, maybe uh, four years. Um, and you know, if you've heard the Hardanger fiddle, which is a Norwegian thing, you'd understand why the Viking orchestra was not very popular. Um, or there's the, uh, the, the famous Norwegian football coach of a very famous Irish team that died in a crash of a plane built by a German company based out of Glendale, West Virginia, and on board with Newt Rockne, who's the, the uh, Norwegian-American, was a German-American wheeling businessman who also perished. So at this point, um, you kind of get the point that I'm, I'm grasping at straws here. <laughs> So uh, I'm, I've also run out of time. Um, so with that, I'm going to tell one last Oli and Lena joke, and then you can all help yourself to some kumkaka that Mary Ann and Julia will be handing out. Um, so this is going to end. This this last joke is going to be the most stoic of all of them. Um, so Oli and Lena had been married for 20 years, and they've been living here in Wheeling for 10. And Lena was getting worried that Oli might not love her anymore. So Lena says, "You never tell me that you love me. So is there someone else?" And Oli says, when we got married, I told you I loved you. And if I ever change my mind, I'll let you know. <laughs> um, so another 20 years pass, and Oli, unfortunately, he, he, he uh, moves on to a higher plane. And so Mina thinks, so I better go down to the newspaper and put it in an obituary. Um, so after offering condolences, the obituary clerk uh, asked Lena what she'd like to, to say about Oli. And she says, you just, you just, but... Oli died. And the reporter says, that's it, just Oli died? And Lena says, yeah, just 
Oli died. So the clerk said, if, if you're concerned about money, the first five words are free. So really, there's got to be more that you can say about Oli. Um, so Lena thought about it for a while, and she said, OK, I got it. You just put Oli died, both for sale. <laughs> So, I, mean, um, I hope you, you don't feel like this was a, a waste of, you know, that you just lost out of your life here. I hope you enjoyed being part of the jest. Um, Sean assured me that if I brought my dog in a, in a Viking helmet that the masses wouldn't get angry and bring out their pitchforks. And unfortunately, I couldn't bring her today, but uh, I did take a picture of her. So this is, this is a uh, movie, The Fearsome. Um, but thank you all for being good sports and for coming out and celebrating with me today. Uh, it's a holiday that I usually celebrate on my own very quietly, so I'm happy that I got to share it this year. Um, so happy set to Dubai and help yourself to some cream caca. And I hope to see you all next Saturday, May 17th. Um, And I, I was worried that there might be questions. <laughs> when you go back to your family, mm -hmm. yes. do they think you sound Southern? It's, I, have, I have noticeably lost my accent. <laughs> After 18 years, it's, it's not, um, I, I, I don't sound as sing-songy as I used to. <laughs> yeah. I have one question. What is Ludafis, um, so again, this, these are harsh conditions that people people lived in. So uh, Ludafisk is a way to make it through the winter. And Ludafisk is, uh, so during the summer months, they'll go out fishing and they'll bring the cod and they'll hang the cod out to dry and it becomes petrified. And so to make it uh, edible again, they have to soak it in baths of lye. And that breaks down the proteins to the point where it's soft enough to eat. So then they have to soak it in, uh, in baths of water to get the lye out so that it doesn't kill them. And so by the time it's palatable, it's got the consistency of jello. So it's basically a, a, a cod jello, is what the fisk is. So, well, yes. I am glad that I can help a fellow Wisconsinite out with this program. All right. Yes. Yeah, Eric, can you say that the, here in this country, the majority of Norwegians are in Wisconsin? Yes, actually, I did have a slide just in case anybody asked this question. So, um, <laughs> The, Min yeah, Minnesota has the most um, descendants. They uh, seven seventy seven seven hundred seventy seven thousand uh, Norwegian Americans in Minnesota. Wisconsin comes in number two at four hundred forty four thousand, and then you can see the Dakotas, uh, Montana, Washington State. That's primarily where the the Norwegians ended up. Primarily Minnesota. Primarily Minnesota, and I grew up. In was my part of Wisconsin. Oh, helps if I'm pointing at the right. I, I grew up like, right there, so near the, the Minnesota border. Any other questions? Oh man. Yeah, we heard about the Irish family, but the potatoes. Okay. Yes. What was the family? What caused the family? Well, interestingly enough, uh, it's potatoes. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, the, as I said, the meat potatoes, the Norwegian version is cotton potatoes. Potatoes are a, a huge staple of, of Norway. And um, Sean was asking me why I didn't bring the lefse. And lefse is a, it's a Norwegian flatbread made with potatoes. But uh, it's, yeah, there's an old joke that says the only thing that Norway produced was rocks and potatoes, rocks, fish, and potatoes. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, there are a lot. So there's reindeer meat, there's whale meat, um, and then they would kept a lot of livestock because the livestock would also keep you um, going through the winters with the, the dairy. Um, so there, it's a big dairy culture as well. All right.
I did see one more hand. Yeah, Little House on the Prairie. So it's a it's a big. Um, every kid reads it back home because that is the sort of that frontier era of the Norwegian Americans coming through. All right. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you have anybody? Do you know of anybody who teaches Nalbending? Who teaches what? Nalbending. Now, no, I don't. I don't. <laughs> that's, that's why I said I was afraid to take questions. Um, could you ex uh, you explain what it is? It is a craft that is older than getting and it's used to Okay. All right. I know there is um like the, is it similar to the lace making or is it it's like uh, Yeah. Okay. No, I've never heard of that before. All right. Oh, um, Pam asked, "What did you just eat?" It's called Krumgaka, and it's filled with uh, whipped cream and lingonberry uh, jam. And so that's uh, my grandma's recipe. Krumgaka. Thank you.